ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Gettysburg East. We make house calls. Delighted you're here. I know why you're here. You're here to make contacts with old friends, and that's great, and to make some new friends, and that's wonderful. You're also here to listen to a great panel tonight, also to listen to our dear friend Susan Eisenhower, and of course, Janet Riggs. Now, that raises the question, why the hell am I here? <laughs> I asked my wife that question just the other night. Why do you think they wanted me to come to Philadelphia? And she said, she's a very honest person, fairly candid. She said, well, Ken, it's because you're old. You're old enough to know everybody in the room. And then she started doing the math, which I'm going to share with you. She said, you know, she said, Gettysburg is now completing its 180th year. You, you have been teaching there for 45 of those years. 1 quarter. 1 quarter of the length of the entire college existence. So then she had a conversation with, oh, and incidentally, there is a rumor that I actually knew Samuel Simon Schmuck. <laughs> but my wife then subsequently had a conversation with President Riggs. And uh, she told her these, fig these mathematical figures, you know, oh, Janet, uh, he's been teaching there for a fourth of the length of the college's existence. And Janet, ever the diplomat, said, you know, Penn is an institution within an institution. <laughs> now notice she did not use the word institutionalized. Okay? She's very diplomatic. She's not just diplomatic. She has great vision. She has, as you all know, wonderful experience with Gettysburg from the bottom to the top as a student, as a professor, and now as president of the college. And she loves that place. I'll tell you, she really does. She is deeply committed to it. She has great vision for the college. She is universally loved, and I mean that sincerely, by the faculty. I know these people. By the faculty, by the students, everyone connected with the college. And she has wonderful integrity. When Jana tells you something, you can take it to the bank. All right. So it is really an honor. I have been through five. I shouldn't say been through. I have worked with. I have worked with five presidents, and they have all brought strength to the college. And I would not say this ever in front of Janet because I don't want her head to swell. But of the five, she is the most outstanding president. Need to introduce to you, Janet. Wow. Ken, you'll have that bonus. <laughs> that was stunning. I really took my breath away. Thank you. That was very kind, more than kind. I am so pleased to welcome you all here tonight. There are so many. Friends of Gettysburg College, alumni of Gettysburg College, parents of Gettysburg College students, we are so pleased to have all of you here tonight for this tremendous event uh, focused on U.S. presidential leadership in transformational times. And I, I know it's always wonderful to get together in a room full of Gettysburg. And Susan and I were just talking about the fact that people seem to know each other and they're introducing themselves to each other, and it's wonderful. But I know that this panel has also been a tremendous draw, and so we want to get to this program quickly. We do offer tremendous programming at Gettysburg College, as many of you know, programs that often draw members of the local community as well as the campus community. But we do realize that not everyone can come to our campus 
for these programs. So once in a while, we like to take Gettysburg on the road. And this Gettysburg Great Symposium is, is one example of that. I want to take a moment and thank Nancy Rose Coons. She's a member of the class of 1980 and a member of the Union League who has opened the door for us to have this event here tonight. Nancy, you're in the audience somewhere. Where are you? Please stand up. Thank you. Thank you so much. All of our speakers tonight have a close affiliation with the Eisenhower Institute a public policy institute now owned and operated by Gettysburg College with offices both on the college campus and in Washington, D.C. With the acquisition of the Eisenhower Institute, Gettysburg College has been able to provide distinctive programming on public policy and leadership for both our students and for the public. Some of you will remember that this was a recommendation made by the Commission on the Future several years ago, and uh, now this vision, I think, is truly coming into focus. The Eisenhower Institute provides the college community with an array of terrific speakers, public policy analysts, scholars, makers, and also it sponsors a series of programs and activities specifically for our students. That program includes a series of seminars that take students to Washington, D.C. to work with visiting experts, to meet with Washington insiders, and to conduct research. It's a program that offers tremendous opportunities for our students to consider how policy decisions are made, uh, also to analyze those decisions and to propose solutions to the difficult challenges that we all face today. I have to say this is a tremendous example of engaged and enriched learning opportunities that we try to offer to our students. And that is an initiative that really is prominent in the campaign that we have just begun at Gettysburg College. Uh, and one that some already some donors have stepped up to support. So we really do very much appreciate that. Given the clear Eisenhower Institute theme to tonight's program, it seems especially appropriate that we will begin with remarks from Susan Eisenhower. Susan Eisenhower is President Dwight D. Eisenhower's granddaughter. She was a founding director and the first president of the Eisenhower Institute before it became a fully Gettysburg College program. Susan is known for her work in the former Soviet Union and in the energy field. She served on several Blue Ribbon Commissions, most recently the Blue Ribbon Commission on America's Nuclear Future. In 2011, she was appointed to the Department of Energy's Nuclear Energy Advisory Committee. She currently sits on the boards of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, the Energy Future Coalition, and the MIT Energy Initiative. She also serves as an advisor to the U.S. Chamber of Commerce's Institute for 21st Century and Energy and the Air Force Academy's Eisenhower Center for Space and Defense Studies. In her capacity as the Eisenhower Institute's Chair of Leadership and Public Policy Programs, Susan currently runs a program for Gettysburg College students called Strategy and Leadership in Transformational Times. We are so pleased to have her engage so closely with Gettysburg College and with Gettysburg College students. And now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Susan Eisenhower. Uh, but still, uh, we have um, a, a big transformational time underway in our country at the moment. Uh, and these usually happen when a president is faced with, uh, when, when change is thrust on a president. Uh, that certainly uh, begins a, a period that is uh, transformational for president, or sometimes we have presidents who actually embark on change themselves and try and bring the country along with them. Usually I think it happens in sequence. Usually some uh, catastrophic or uh, significant event uh, changes the environment in which we're living and the way we think about uh, issues. Uh, and then it's either up to that president to uh, manage the change that's happened on his watch, or it's up to the next president uh, to give shape to that. Uh, think about some of the uh, uh, times since my grandfather, for instance, uh, became president of the United States. That was a transformational time, too. And while there was one president, Harry Truman, who was the immediate president after uh, World War II, it was really the Eisenhower years, which were the years of revolution. You wouldn't know that, actually, by reading about those little sleepy days, you know, where I sat on the golf course the whole time and people are having little parties in, in um, uh, poodle skirts and that type of thing, you know, Elvis Presley. No, no, actually, they were revolutionary times. 
I'd like to say that the reason we can look back on it nostalgically and think of how peaceful it is is simply that they were well-managed years. But the um, tectonic plate shifted uh, for Eisenhower in 1953. It was very simple. Joseph Stalin died in March of that year, and in August, which was the big event, the Soviet Union broke America's monopoly on the hydrogen bomb. That changed everything. Uh, for uh, the hydrogen bomb, which was 100 times more powerful uh, than an atomic weapon that we used um, at Hiroshima and Nagasaki, uh, this was um, an unthinkable um, weapon of uh, awesome power. Uh, bring with that uh, delivery vehicles to uh, actually uh, deliver a, uh, an atomic uh, or a hydrogen um, bomb on the other side and you had uh, a formula for uh, great um, potential danger. Uh, and so we could call maybe the uh, transformational time of Eisenhower's period uh, the time when there really was a revolution in military affairs. Uh, and then at the same time, of course, it was a period of great uh, uh, public and social change. Uh, then, of course, we all remember, I think, well, the 1970s. Uh, we're hearing more about this um, because uh, we had some of our uh, current candidates uh, reflecting back on uh, Jimmy Carter and Ronald Reagan. Uh, but the 1970s, I think, were marked by another uh, tumultuous event, and that was the oil shocks of the early 70s. Uh, this brought a sense of impotence here in the United States, uh, and we realized uh, the full extent of uh, what dependency um, on energy supplies abroad could really mean for this country. You may remember that uh, Jimmy Carter took to wearing sweaters and turning out the lights at the White House. It was during that time that the Department of Energy uh, was established, and I think you know, on one of those um, uh, chats that Jimmy Carter had with the rest of us, he uh, talked about uh, oil, uh, the oil shocks, and the uh, use of um, oil pricing as a weapon as the moral equivalent of war. Um, we all noted later that uh, the acronym was a little uh, unsettling, meow, but uh, nevertheless, <laughs> it was a period of significant change. Uh, since Carter did not win a second term, uh, the challenge of managing uh, a transformation of this type fell to Ronald Reagan, who really, in my book, uh, transformed the way we think about wealth creation. Uh, in fact, um, this was the uh, dawn of supply-side economics, uh, trickle-down theory, and a new idea about uh, who the job creators are and how that actually happens. Uh, the legacy of those ideas are still with us today, uh, but indeed it was a period of revolution. Now, I'm not sure that uh, you want to get me started on um, uh, the United States' role in the collapse of the Soviet Union. I see no connection to speak of. Uh, that's for another lecture. Uh, in any case, though, we um, uh, took uh, this part of the world very seriously, as we should have, um, and actually engaged in a significant military buildup that began, really, um, a significant government spending in that area. And so in the 1980s, then, we move um, into another, the big shift, the big geopolitical tectonic shift of the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, without uh, getting into the second lecture, I promised you for another occasion, uh, the United States actually supported um, the uh, continuation of the Soviet Union, believe it or not. Uh, in 1991, um, we had an American president stand in Kiev and urge the Ukrainians to remain part of the Soviet Union. Uh, but in fact, the Soviet Union collapsed of its own weight through rigidity and um, an inhumane system that uh, brought uh, its uh, tenuous hold on power to an end. In any case, this shift now was of substantial proportions. Uh, and the Clinton administration uh, had the business of trying to manage what to do uh, after the end of the, that period. Uh, we had uh, many things that happened, but I think because we regarded ourselves as victorious at the end of the Cold War, parentheses not to be mistaken with the collapse of the Soviet Union, uh, we had a tendency actually not to rethink our strategic position, but just to double down and do more of the same. That's when NATO was expanded. Uh, we encircled Russia with uh, our pipeline policy. Um, and uh, we took other measures that uh, assumed that things were just um, um, more of the same, but we had uh, now a new opportunity to uh, bring our ideas to that part of the world. That, in fact, was true, but we did lose a strategic opportunity. Um, and so um, the, uh, 
the, uh, the last big tectonic shift is the one we're living through right now. Uh, this, of course, uh, started um, with 9-11, at least the most overt part of it. Uh, but in fact, uh, the, uh, many of the other uh, elements of this particular shift started way before then. And of course, you know what I mean, the uh, great financial crisis of 2008. And so that brings us to this period of uh, now what do we do? Uh, what do we do uh, in an environment where we're being asked to think the unthinkable? Every day we're asked to think the unthinkable as we were this summer when we actually debated who could have, who could have thunk that the United States of America would be debating whether or not we ought to uh, make good on our obligations, our debt obligations to other countries. Pretty amazing. Uh, and then of course we had the downgrade uh, of our credit, uh, which has really uh, made Americans ask themselves not only a, a set of questions they hadn't asked themselves before, but to really uh, wonder about the underpinnings uh, of this society as we go forward. And so it's with some amusement, having gone through a quick flip through um, the last 60 years, um, that um, we find that people sort of are talking like this upcoming election is sort of a, a normal election. Um, Obama's being held to some kind of standard. Are you better off today than you were when he became president? Well, I think that we're missing the entire point here. Uh, we had uh, those events in 2008 uh, were a bipartisan uh, crisis. Uh, the crisis began um, in a Republican administration that was part of a, a set of trends that were underway from well before that period. Uh, and now a Democratic president finds himself uh, in a position to, um, to have to deal with this. In any case, uh, all I can say, because I think we're going to have a fascinating election here, is that I don't actually think the difference is very stark. I think that both uh, candidates are uh, very much constrained uh, by the institutional underpinnings uh, of our country. That would be there, it, the idea that uh, we would have a contest between, I think, what's the word they're using here now, the self-reliant um, versus the dependency issue. Uh, is kind of irrelevant. It's hard to imagine that any big shift uh, in those kinds of issues is going to take place. And yet we still have financial weakness that I'm sure uh, worries all of you as we go forward. Um, so let me uh, just close by saying that my observation uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed um, is that it, it brought underway uh, a set of debates that took place in nearly every country but the United States of America. When the Soviet Union collapsed, of course, the Russian Federation was no longer part of the Soviet Union, nor were the, uh, the independent, uh, newly independent states that had also been part of the Soviet Union. So they had to ask themselves, what kind of a country are we going to be? Now that we're not powerful anymore, now that our political system and our economies collapsed, and they sort of figured out the answer to that. They decided that they would be uh, a European country. Uh, Eastern Europe had its huge debate. Well, we're not dependent on the Soviet bloc anymore. Uh, what kind of a country do we want to be? And Western Europe had that debate too. We're not dependent on the United States for our security anymore. What are we going to be if we're now independent from uh, the framework that was uh, very much a part of the Cold War? So the United States of America is the only country that hasn't had that debate yet. And we're having it now. And I can only say, uh, in closing, that I think this is the healthiest thing uh, that could happen to us. The problem is that it's happened 20 years later than it might otherwise have done. But we've got a very exciting time underway. We've got uh, uh, an enormous number of things to deal with, uh, everything from financial stabilization uh, to the wind down of two, uh, two wars uh, to larger macro issues like climate change, which have, in effect, changed so much of our thinking. And so it's a real pleasure for me to be on the panel this evening and to uh, be a part of, of this terrific event and to hear these great presentations that are yet to come. Thank you. So I thought what I would do uh, is start off with uh, one of my favorite quotes from Churchill, uh, who said that the key thing to being successful in politics is to describe to people what's going to happen ahead of time. And then when it doesn't happen, explain to them why it didn't happen. Um, so I give you that caveat. I'm going to try to talk about um, the Obama leadership experience and his effectiveness, as Dr. Mott has asked me to. 
uh, and try to kind of throw out some, some, some thought-provoking ideas about the election with the caveat that I could be completely wrong. Uh, <laughs> so let's run through a couple of questions. First of all, and I've done this with your kids in my program, so forgive me if several of them are here and they've heard some of this. Um, what has Obama gotten right? What does he have going for him in terms of his leadership style uh, and his effectiveness going into the 2012 campaign? I think he has a number of things going for him. First of all uh, is his demeanor. And we're very close to Princeton here tonight. Uh, Fred Greenstein is a big idol of mine. Uh, he developed uh, a series of, of components that he judges presidents by, the most important of which is emotional intelligence. That is, is a president in command of himself. It's hard to lead a country when you're not in command of yourself. Um, it sounds very simple. It sounds like common sense. Think about the last 100 years of presidents, and you'll be surprised how few of them have had emotional intelligence. I believe Barack Obama does. Uh, in, a, in a very high order, I believe that he has great command of himself. He has command of his emotions. He's not easily rattled. He's mentally tough, sports coaches like to say. And I think that counts for a lot, and I think that counts for a lot of his leadership success in the last three years. He's been able to weather the storm because of his emotional intelligence, and I think that bodes very well for him going into the election. Second, and again, this sounds very simple, but as somebody who's worked on a number of campaigns, uh, it's something I always look for, he's likable. Barack Obama is a likable guy. And if you look again at the last several presidential cycles, we tend to elect people that we like. And there's a reason for this, because with the explosion of the media and the fact that we not only have 500 cable channels, but we now have Twitter and Facebook and the internet and everything else, we spend a lot of time with presidents. They're in our house all the time. They're in our lives every day. We want to be around somebody that we like. I think Barack Obama is a very likable guy. You see that when he goes on ESPN and he fills out his bracket. He seems like a regular guy, and that, I think, again, bodes very well for him. They seem trivial to you, again, as somebody who's worked on a lot of campaigns, it's not. Um, I've worked for a lot of candidates who have the other problem, and it's a, it's a much bigger problem. <laughs> <laughs> and then the, the third thing that I would say about his leadership that I think has been profoundly effective and really good for the country is his successful management of his brand. And again, this is the, the campaigner and me talking. We talk a lot about brands and campaign work. Um, I think Obama has always understood what his brand is, and a lot of candidates don't. Um, if you think back to the 2008 campaign, if you think back to a famous speech, he actually gave a speech here in Philadelphia on a race, and then a few weeks later, he gave a much shorter speech in North Carolina, where he sort of officially denounced Jeremiah Wright. If you remember that speech, the second one, he began it by saying uh, that unity and cohesion is not just something that he talks about, and these were his words, it's in my DNA. Yeah, it's a marvelous brand, a marvelous expression of it. A way to say that I don't just talk about people coming together, I am the very result of people coming together. I am a diversity uh, in who I am as a person. And I think he's always understood that the country was really yearning for that. They wanted somebody to transcend race, to transcend politics as usual, to be different. And I think he's guarded that brand very effectively and, and fought for it. Um, so I think those are strategically three very powerful things that he takes with him into the campaign, and they reflect very well on the effectiveness of his leadership. Um, he also, by the way, has a number of external things going for him. Um, number one is history. We tend to re-elect presidents, believe it or not. You look at the last 50 years of history, actually 60 years, going back to uh, Susan's grandfather, we tend to elect presidents and then re-elect them. Eisenhower got two terms, Kennedy Johnson got two terms, Nixon got two terms, so we didn't finish. Carter's an aberration, he gets one. Reagan actually gets two and then a third with Bush. Um, then you have, <laughs> essentially, then you have Clinton getting two and then you have Bush getting two. We tend to want people to finish the job. We tend to want them to get a second chance. And I think Obama will experience some of that as well. People will want to uh, at least consider giving him a second chance. He also faces a very, uh, Unenergized opposition. Um, we've all seen the, the Republican primaries, and I think Jennifer or, or Shirley Ann's going to touch on that here in a little bit. Um, it's a great asset to an incumbent to have a, an opposition that's not as excited as your base is. Uh, and then finally, believe it or not, his numbers. And this will come as a surprise to many of you who, who have looked at his, his public approval. 
my, my advice to you when looking at polls, always look at the average. Don't look at an individual poll. The average of all the public polls together tends to be more accurate than any one poll. And as I speak tonight, Obama's average of all the public polls is about 48%. That sounds bad, and it's not great. George W. Bush on election day in 2004 was below that, and he was reelected. So he's actually within range of being reelected right now, um, despite all of the challenges that he faces. Now, let's talk about some of those challenges. That's sort of the, the, the last piece of this, is, is what's, the, what's the bad part of the story for him? And the bad part of the story, as Susan alluded to, is there have been a number of, of, of economic challenges that he faces. Now, um, I'll give you just three that you're going to hear repeatedly from Republicans, and it'll be interesting to see kind of the Obama response to these. You're going to hear that in January of 2009, there were 133 million Americans working. Today, there were 130 million Americans working. It's three million plus. You're going to hear that in January of 2009, uh, the national debt, which is the cumulative debt that just adds up all the deficits ever collected in, in history, was about 10 trillion. Now it's approaching 15 trillion. And you're going to hear that gas prices have doubled from where they were in January of 2009. Now here's the thing, and Susan already said this, and she's absolutely right. Context is what matters. And each one of these, you can easily make an argument for how this happened. It was an inherited issue. There are extenuating circumstances. And the Obama campaign will try to do that. The problem in a campaign setting is when you are explaining, you are losing. Because the American people have, uh, it's very difficult to explain in a sound bite. It's very difficult to explain in a 30 second ad why gas prices are doubled or why $5 trillion have been added to the national debt. So the, the extent to which they have to spend time explaining is a problem. It's a problem for any campaign, and I think it'll be a problem for them as well. Um, I think what you will likely see, and I've talked about this in my seminars with my students at Gettysburg, I think in many ways you will see a replay of the Bush campaign of 2004, where you had similar approval numbers, as I just mentioned, to Obama's. You had economic challenges, different, but economic challenges nonetheless. And you had an alternative that the country was not sold on. And so the Bush campaign spent a lot of time talking about John Kerry. I think Barack Obama's going to spend a lot of time talking about Joe Romney. And you're going to hear a lot about bank capital. You're going to hear a lot about um, how private equity works. Um, you're going to hear a lot about uh, Romney's record. Uh, probably, they'll probably talk more about Romney's record than their own. And if I had to predict, um, I would say that that's probably going to be enough. And I would predict to you, and I've said this publicly um, in my political writings, I uh, said it Politico two years ago, I can say it to you again tonight. I think it'll be a very close election. I think Obama probably wins. Um, but it'll be a very entertaining election, a very competitive election, and one that will be fascinating for all of us to watch. And I think in the end, he pulls it out. Although, with the Churchill caveat, I reserve the right to <laughs> Thank you all very much. 2012 is a contest of leadership. How well Barack Obama and Mitt Romney convey their leadership styles and what kind of leader the country wants will determine the winner. Mitt Romney is resetting his campaign after a bruising primary that took him up to the right on social issues and alienated independence. Who is the real Mitt Romney? Is he a silver spoon candidate, a throwback? Or can he reemerge as a leader who appeals to voters beyond the white males he polls well with? When Romney aide Eric Fernstrom famously blundered and said the race after the primary is reset like an Etch-a-Sketch, it stuck. Romney became, for a long news cycle, the Etch-a-Sketch candidate. It went to the heart of whether Romney has a core set of convictions to lead on. Having been criticized for flip-flopping and pandering on issues like health care, abortion, and gay marriage, there are many voters and political observers who don't trust him as a leader. The bigger question than where Governor Romney is on any of those issues is what kind of leader he would be, and if he's changed his positions on key issues, is he really a leader? So Romney has a, de a leadership deficit to close in this election. President Obama, not having been pushed into difficult positions by a tough primary fight, is in a better position now to court independent voters than Romney is. Obama's biggest leadership vulnerability, though, is on jobs and the economy, voters' top issues. 
Polls show that Americans are still vitally concerned about the economy, and Governor Romney has come out punching. It's, a, it's still about the economy, and we're not stupid, Romney said Tuesday on the stump. Romney made the case that his 25 years of business experience had given him the skills to, to quote, lead us out of this stagnant Obama economy and into a job-creating economy. With a competitive primary race behind him, Romney has found his voice. He's more organized, he's less stiff, and he says, quote, many Americans were just now beginning to focus on the choice before the country. With a huge war chest and campaign operation, Obama's ready for Romney's attacks. In the new Rolling Stone magazine, Obama says, quote, you have a presumptive Republican nominee that believes in drastically rolling back environmental regulations, that believes in drastically rolling back collective bargaining rights, that believes in an approach to deficit reduction in which taxes are cut further for the wealthiest Americans and spending cuts are entirely borne by things like education. Defending himself on the economy, Obama goes on. The vision that there's, that there's a sliver of folks doing well at the top who are unencumbered by any regulatory restraints whatsoever, that the nation will grow and prosperity will trickle down. The challenge that they're going to have is we tried it. From 2000 to 2008, that was the agenda. It did not work out well, and I think the American people understand that. So let's look at leadership styles. So far, Governor Romney put away his primary opponents through negative ads, aided by outside groups like Restore Our Future, which snowballed Gingrich and Santorum. Now Carl Rove's on board and has tens of millions of dollars to spend from Crossroads GPS to help Romney win. The biggest challenge here for Romney is, if he goes negative, what does that tell voters about his leadership style? Adding negativity to a perceived leadership void may be a bad calculation, you're still left without the impression of a leader. If passed this prologue, observers estimate that Romney will launch negative, largely third-party attacks against Obama. Will it work? President Obama, with a potential of nearly a billion dollars to spend, will go after Romney's weaknesses. Those will surely center around his vacillations or his lack of leadership. In fact, Romney is also vulnerable to the right for not leading the conservative cause. This mirrors the way many on the left feel about Obama, that he hasn't led a liberal enough agenda, and that he's left too much up to Congress. The campaign in bold strokes will play out on this leadership theme, with both candidates trying to persuade the electorate that the other is the weaker leader. The candidates are at different phases in their campaigns. <coughs> Romney has moved into general election mode, moving to the center and focusing on the economy and President Obama. Obama is in a different place. He's coalition building, having had a free ride during the, the primaries. Obama is reaching out to key constituencies. A new Harvard Institute of Politics poll shows that President Obama has widened his lead among 18 to 29-year-old millennial voters by, to 17 points. Obama's courting the youth vote with an emphasis on the issue of student loans and an appearance on late night TV. Another key constituency both candidates will try to stake out leadership positions with is women. A Pew Center poll shows Obama leading women under 50 by 18 percentage points. Among women over 50, Obama leads by seven points. Analyst Charlie Cook says, Democrats hope to make the case that Republicans have tailored their priorities for white men, particularly white men over 50, to such a degree that they seem to deliberately exclude women voters, especially younger women. If, if Romney is to overcome that and win, he has to feel to women like a leader. During the primary race, the momentum Rick Santorum had pulled the race towards conservative social issues, including abortion and birth control. Romney pushed to the right on those issues to gain the trust of conservatives and secure the nomination. In so doing, he left a vacuum of leadership trust among female and independent voters. President Obama, having not been pushed by a primary race, is in a better position than Romney among independents. But Obama's biggest vulnerability on leadership remains the economy and jobs. It is on those issues that Romney will stake out leadership ground, making the case that he's in a better position to lead the country out of a recession. Here, Obama is vulnerable. Supporters point out that the recession began under President Bush and that through stimulus and other measures, Obama is leaving the country out of recession. So voters 
will voters switch course and have the desire to change leaders during troubled times? If Romney convinces them that he can lead the economy to jobs and growth, they will. Romney's message is later laser focused on the president's lack of leadership on the economy. Starting in October, we'll watch the debates. Both candidates are formidable debaters and the economy will be front and center. Ultimately, voters will choose based not on the style of the candidates, but on the leader they trust to get things done. Thank you. Well, what you've heard with our um, just very distinguished panel is some themes, and I'm actually going to reiterate those themes. This is a panel that was brought together to try and assess really what do we think is going to happen in this election. It's an interesting election. It's a president that has had um, his share of issues in the last three and a half years, and the question is do we think he's going to be elect re-elected? And what you're going to hear from me is yes. You've heard it from every one of the three panelists, and you will hear it from me. Yes, this president will be re-elected. And I want to give you some thoughts on why. And this talks, I'm going to talk about leadership. Do we as a country think that this president has brought together the leadership necessary to continue for four years? For more years. And one of the things that Casey mentioned is a very simple thing. We do not easily throw out our presidents. We want to give them a chance. All of them come in with challenges, and all of them come in with, gosh, I don't really know how to be present. And there's a steep learning curve. There are challenges that they come in with, both uh, in this president's case, the economy in particular, but it's difficult to be president. It's a steep learning curve. And what I want to do for a few minutes is compare how this particular president, Barack Obama, compares to perhaps some other two-term presidents. I want to break it down into several categories. I want to begin with one important thing, personality, personality, personality. Life is a series of relationships, folks. It is personal chemistry that makes the world go round. How well do people click? And how well the President of the United States clicks with the American citizenry is absolutely key to his reelection. We like Barack Obama. Polls, they're important. Casey will tell you they're important. We can talk all about whether we need to average polls or which poll is better, but polls tell the story, folks. And this particular president has a 64% likability. Likability, we like this guy. Well, let's look back at some other presidents. Let's go back to Susan's grandfather, Dwight David Eisenhower. Did we like Dwight David Eisenhower? We did like Dwight David Eisenhower. We trusted Dwight David Eisenhower. And even in the midst of the u scandal, we liked the man. The biggest scandal of his administration, we liked the man. Think forward a little bit. How about Jimmy Carter? Did you really like Jimmy Carter? Did you like the fact that he got up on national television and talked about a crisis of confidence? I don't know what to do. There's a confidence in this government, he says, and I don't know what to do. Does that instill faith in the American people that the leader of this country gets up and says, I don't know what to do? It's not my fault, it's your fault, because you don't have confidence in us? So what do we do to Jimmy Carter? We got rid of him. Then we elected, again, somebody we liked. Who do we like? We liked Ronald Reagan. He's running against Jimmy Carter. We said, out with Jimmy Carter. We elect Ronald Reagan. And throughout two terms of Ronald Reagan, the man was totally embroiled in Iran-Contra. Not a good thing if you remember Iran-Contra. And then, again, do you remember in 1987, the whole stock market crash? We still like the man. We like him so much, we give him, as Casey said, a third term. <laughs> Then we look around at the guy we gave the third term to, and we say, oh my gosh, that isn't Ronald Reagan. What's the matter? That's George H.W. Bush. And when we give them a real look at, we don't like him. And we throw him out. And then comes this young guy named Bill Clinton. <coughs> Bill Clinton runs for election 1992 against George H.W. Bush, we don't like. Do you remember when he goes to the grocery store and he, he puts the thing through? And it, he says, oh my God, what's that? And they said, it's a scanner. The American public goes to the grocery and there's a scanner. He'd never heard of a scanner before because he was so distant. He had no idea what, was, what a scanner was. He had no idea to go to the grocery. We liked him. 
Bill Clinton. Bill Clinton, as you remember, had his share of problems. <laughs> and still, he left office, folks. We re-elect him in 1996. Republicans put up Bob Dole. Probably wasn't their finest moment. <laughs> but we really like him. And he leaves, in spite of being impeached by the House of Representatives, with the highest public approval rating in history. George W. Bush. George W. Bush comes into office, and we really like him. The Democrats put up this guy named Al Gore. It's sort of, you know, an automatic escalator. If you're president, if you're the vice president, you get to go up and be president next time. Al, do you remember Al Gore? The lockbox. <laughs> we didn't like Al Gore. So we liked the guy we liked, George W. Bush. And then, four years later, what is the matter with the Democrats? They don't get this likability issue. Do you remember who they put up? John Kerry. <laughs> Who liked John Kerry? The guy's cold as a stone wall. So who does the American public really like? George W. Bush. We like George W. Bush. So that brings us to Barack Obama. We really like Barack Obama. Something about him. He's sort of magical. Who do the Republicans put up? Mitt Romney. <laughs> and the last poll I saw, at about 26% on the likability factor. So just keep in mind that we think likability is an important characteristic of being president. Let me talk about some other things that yeah, they're pretty important too. Meeting your agenda. President's folks need to meet their agenda. When they campaign, they need to have a set of very clear goals. We're not that smart a society. We can handle maybe three things. That's all we can handle. So every president knows this. You come up with three things and you run for president. And you have to meet those three things when you're president. Two-term presidents have been pretty successful at meeting their three things. Did Ronald Reagan pledge to increase military defense and bring down the Soviet Union? Yeah, did a pretty good job on that. Did Bill Clinton promise to uh, rebuild the economy? Yep, did a pretty good job on that. Did George W. Bush promise to get those terrorists that got us on 9-11? Yep, went right into Afghanistan. When presidents pledge something and they do it, we think it's pretty important and we value that. So let's look at Barack Obama. Did he get health care through? He got it through. Whether it's challenged in the Supreme Court or not, he got it through. That's important. Did he fix the economy? Ooh, that's a little bit tough, isn't it? It's not in quite as good a shape as he would like. So he needs to talk about some other things. He needs to just hedge that a little bit. Are we on the right path? I think both Casey and Jennifer talked about this. Yes, he will need to talk about we're on the right path. I didn't cause this. The problem is the American public is not really, um, uh, does not like to hear whines and moans. They expect their leaders to get the job done, which means in the next year, he's going to have to come up with some very tangible economic numbers. That's going to be very important. What's interesting about Barack Obama is he was the domestic policy president. He wasn't the national security president. However, you will see this president campaigning heavily on national security credentials. Do you remember the little merchant marine ship that was floating around, I forget where, and the Somali, I guess near Somalia, and the Somali pirates got it, and they kept the captain in the little dinghy boat, and Barack Obama sent in the Navy, and the Navy marksmen stood on the bow of that ship, and they shot the people and kept the captain, they saved the captain. That's small, but it happened under Barack Obama's watch. Do you remember Osama bin Laden? He was killed under Barack Obama's watch. Iraq troops are coming home under Barack Obama's watch. One of the things that I guarantee you you'll see, and uh, Casey and Jennifer have both talked about this, is you'll see the economy being de-emphasized. Casey talked about you'll see um, an emphasis on personality, that is Mitt Romney. We don't like Mitt Romney's personality, we don't like his wealth. That'll be emphasized, and the US economy will <coughs> be emphasized. 
But you'll also see a huge play on national security and the strengths of this administration, which is actually very surprising. Um, third, crisis management. How well presidents manage crisis, and th this is true whether you're CEO of a company, CEO of a college, CEO of the United States of America. Crisis management is how, uh, to a significant extent, we judge leaders. This is a talk a little bit about leadership. And how well presidents deal with both domestic crisis and foreign policy crisis. Bill Clinton had very few crises. Surprising when you think back. He had a personal crisis with Monica Lewinsky. But it was eight years, actually, of very little domestic or foreign policy issues. Remember, this was a president that had nothing significant going on. He got involved in Kosovo and Bosnia of his own choice. This was a peacemaking president that's primary foreign policy legacy has to do with um, peace in the Middle East, has to do with peace in Northern Ireland, doesn't have to do with wars that he was engaged in. Domestically, his biggest crisis was how does he get us out of an economic slump, and he succeeded in that. George W. Bush, how did he deal with crisis management? He would give him very strong marks for foreign policy crisis management following the terrorist attacks. He would actually give him very weak marks for domestic policy. In fact, except for the tax cuts and No Child Left Behind, there isn't a single measurable domestic achievement. And the largest crisis management, was, which is Katrina, was an utter and complete failure. Well, interestingly enough, Barack Obama has had um, only one major domestic crisis, and that was the BP oil spill, which is very similar, of course, to the Katrina event. And um, Barack Obama took, learned from Katrina and immediately sent in um, a huge national task force to deal with it. And if you remember, he brought the BP executives to the White House and browbeat them, for lack of a better word, to setting up a, a trust fund to reimburse all the people on the Gulf Coast. So when you talk about leadership, um, I would say he gets high marks in national security. He, uh, there are problems, of course, with North Korea. There are problems with Iran. He seems to momentarily contain them both. He seems to have handled um, rogue uh, nuclear weapons. They've gone off the map right now. He's pulling out of Iraq. Problems with Afghanistan. I think the American public is still concerned with Afghanistan. Um, by and large, he's done okay. So he gets he gets okay marks um, for crisis management. Um, Barack Obama's problem is that he has maintained, and I and we have talked about this with other panelists. In my view, Barack Obama is the face of the, of the U.S. government. I think that's a very bad thing. That there are very few people in this room that perhaps you can name the Secretary of State to look at Hillary Clinton. Perhaps you can name the Secretary of Defense, but after that it's really downhill. That you don't see a national television every night, uh, cabinet members talking about the environment. Cabinet members should be out there talking about the environment. The face of the United States government is not one man. And that's a little bit of a negative. He needs to broaden the American public's understanding of what this government does. Um, let me let me conclude. A couple other things I want to say, but I won't I won't get into them right now. Is um, I'm sure you all know that Congress, the House of Representatives, we now have divided government, we have unified government, which we had in the first two years of his administration, and the. Um, divided government, of course, has caused some serious uh, problems, particularly because it's a conservative Republicans in the House of Representatives, and the Tea Party has, of course, become very loud um, for John Boehner. What has happened is, you, is the American public has become somewhat disenchanted with Barack Obama because he seems to be trying to be conciliatory to this Congress. That's about to end. What you're seeing with Barack Obama, it started several weeks ago, is to say to Congress, I don't need you to move these policies forward. We're moving from what is called the legislative presidency, that is, you need Congress, to the administrative presidency. This is a president that you're going to see in the next few months aggressively use administrative actions, aggressively use executive orders. Doggone it, he does not need Congress to set emission standards. He can do that with executive orders with EPA. And what you're going to see is you're going to HHS. HHS can take huge control over the insurance industry and over healthcare. 
you're going to see a whole series in the next few months of executive actions showing the strength of the presidency and showing this president take executive action to move forward his agenda. That is leadership. It's not obstructed by an obstructionist Congress. The American public does not want to hear, I can't get anything through because I have a Congress that doesn't agree with me. The American public wants to hear, I am in charge, you gave me a mandate to do something and I am going to do it. And he is going to do it, and he's going to do it through executive actions. So let me just summarize. These are the points that I, I want to bring up to you. What gets the president reelected? And this is what's happened consistently of every two-term president, likability. You just plain like these people. Consistency. They're consistent in their actions. You know where they're going. They deliver. They deliver on the expectations. They deliver on what they promised. That is absolutely key. And finally, grace under fire. Every president takes fire. How well they handle it, we judge them. Thank you very much. Let's go. Concern about the impact of the Citizens United uh, case of 2010, and we've seen some of this unfolding with enormous amounts of money funneling into the campaigns uh, from from single individuals in many cases. Yeah. Um, comments, Susan, you want to talk about that? Or? Well, I think there's Jenna? there's a real danger that uh, fear is going to be uh, one of the subtexts. Uh, of this campaign because whenever you're in a, a transformational time, a very difficult time, you have um, uh, extremists who uh, articulate um, and then and actually today the facts are uh, quite independent of uh, opinion anyway. Uh, and it's, um, it's, it's, a, it's a very big worry for me. Think about that transformational time I talked about earlier during the Eisenhower administration. Let's not forget during the same period of time we had McCarthyism in this country. This was a, a direct um, a result of um, the beginning of the Cold War and the rest of it, and so I think we have to be very alert to this. I just would um, end by saying it seems very ironic that we all identified money in politics as being one of the biggest problems facing this country, and there's more money in politics today than it's ever been. Why we can't seem to get a handle on that is beyond me. I think um, one key issue is, as I said earlier, alluded to, um, Romney being sort of the unknown in this equation during this election stands to lose a lot by going with third party groups to help mm -hmm. use fear to define Barack Obama. Um, I think that it could actually make him seem like an angry male. And I think that could potentially really do him in. It worked during the primaries, but the dynamic was totally different. So I think there's a real risk for Romney there. And I think Obama has a risk if he were to try that path, although I think he has so much campaign money in his war chest, he won't need to rely on the other outside groups. Um, he's promised a different kind of campaigning, a different kind of politics, and I think voters will hold him accountable to that. Yes. Yes. Um, any prediction on a uh, vice president candidate for Mitt Romney? I have a prediction, uh, and we were we were talking about this, uh, and, and feel free to disagree with me because we do disagree on this. We can't hear you. Very you can't. Well. Um, I think first of all, when you pick a vice president, there's what's called the insider-outsider strategy, that an insider uh, presidential candidate picks an outsider as a vice president. Does that help? Yeah. 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 Uh, and what this means is that if you, if you are Mitt Romney, you are a political outsider, you're a governor, and they need to pick a political insider, somebody from Washington, D.C. If you're from Washington, D.C., you pick an outsider. And we only pick two categories, folks. We only pick governors and senators because governors know how to build coalitions and senators are elite. We never pick anybody from the House, Newt Gingrich never had a chance, because we as America always think the House is the House of the common people, and we don't elect from the House, only governors and senators. So when, when you pick when you, a presidential candidate in generals, <laughs> Thank you. 
General Jackson, you're right. <laughs> um, so, uh, for instance, Barack Obama really was a political outsider. He was very new to the Senate. He needed what we call a political insider, that's what uh, Joe Biden did. But, uh, John Kennedy, fairly new to the Senate, picks a political uh, insider, Lyndon Johnson, insider outsider. Which means that when Mitt Romney is picking his vice president, he's an outsider, he's a governor, he needs a senator. Well, who are the senators that we think are on that short list? And right now, he's been campaigning a lot with Marco Rubio of Florida, a young senator from Florida. Well, what does Marco Rubio bring to the table? Well, does he bring Florida's electoral votes? That'd be wonderful. You often pick a vice presidential candidate to bring an electoral vote to your ticket. That's how Kennedy picks Johnson also, because it's very nice to bring Texas in on the electoral votes. If, if uh, Marco Rubio is selected, he is a Cuban American. And Cuban Americans are not what most Hispanics consider Hispanic. They represent a different constituency. The Hispanic constituency that is a voting constituency of the rest of the country is a Mexican constituency. And it's that Mexican constituency, the Democrats in particular, the Republicans right now, are fighting over New Mexico, Colorado, and Nevada. And there is a significant Hispanic population there. If any of those, if any candidate wins those three states, they win the presidency. You know, you talk about you have to win Ohio, you have to win Florida. No, it's Nevada, Colorado, and New Mexico right now. And you have to have an Hispanic. And Marco Rubio is Cuban. He's not going to be picked. Uh, Rob Portman, however, is the senator from Ohio. He's a moderate. That's good because one of the things that I didn't talk about is that 40% of us self-identify as Democrats. 40% of us self-identify as Republicans. And folks, if you're a Democrat, you will vote for any guy that says I'm a Democrat. That's Barack Obama. If you're a Republican, you'll vote for any guy that says he's a Republican. That's Mitt Romney. So you're going to get 40%. Every candidate is going to get at least 40%. But to win the presidency, you need that middle ground. You need 20% people that self-identify as independents. Um, and actually, you don't need all 20%. You just need 10.11, you know, 0, 0, 0, 1. Um, <coughs> So how, how, how do you get that 10% to get you over 50%? And I don't think Marco Rubio is going to do it. I think you need a moderate ind independent, a moderate, to bring in the moderate independents into your camp. And I think that's Rob Portman of Ohio. But you guys all have other views than me. Well, I, I would just take a slightly different view. I, I mentioned earlier one of Romney's problems is the excitement level of his base. Okay, there's an anecdote to that problem, and it's called Rubio. Rubio immediately fires up the Republican base in a way that really no other Republican candidate out there does. The other thing I would say about Rubio is, and I agree with Shirley with analysis, I'm, I'm very skeptical in general of the significance of vice presidential selections. I don't think they ultimately. Hey, but, but, but Sarah Palin's back. You know, Rubio's not Sarah Palin. <laughs> <laughs> Rubio is not certain. Let me, and I, and I would just add to that, Ken. Two other things. Number one, I think he does bring forward. And number two, he's not Hispanic. He is more Hispanic than Joe Biden. But he's Cuban. <laughs> he is more Hispanic than Joe Biden. Let me add just one footnote to what has been said here, and that, and it comes from George Will, I think, a week or two ago, who gave us a pretty lengthy list of vice presidential candidates in the modern period who failed to carry their own states. So take that with a grain of salt. Okay, we have uh, one or two more. Yes. Yes, sir. Uh, the Obama administration has done something that hasn't been done since probably the early 1700s, and that's unite the entire leadership of the Catholic Church in one mindset. Uh, the fact that all of the Catholic bishops are now opposed to the Obama administration, what kind of effect is that going to have that the leadership of the church is now going to be shepherding its members against the president and his um, agenda? <laughs> There is a very large question as to how much shepherding can actually be done, yeah. Yeah. I think, in this particular instance. Yes? Yeah, I would just say briefly, I mean, the question to me is, is one of sort of active religious engagement. Um, it's one thing for the bishops to say, you know, we object to, to what the administration has done on, on health plans and birth control. 
it's another thing to, to translate that and say every single Catholic voter will, will go do that. The evidence suggests that, that that typically doesn't happen. Same thing with evangelicals. And there's always a, a divide when we look at exit results between people who are active evangelicals, they go to church, and people who are just sort of Christians or, or claim to be Christians. So I think, it's, I think it's helpful to answer your question to the Republican Party. Um, I, I don't know if it's a game changer or not. Let's take one more, and then we'll mingle a little bit. Please, right in the front here. Yeah, I have a question about the millennial vote. Obviously, it was a huge swing for Barack Obama uh, back in his re-election, and the way the millennials came out and, and uh, the whole increase in vote, I'm sure you experienced it on, on Gettysburg's campus, as, as we did on the campus that I work at. So I'm curious to know, because I've been reading recently the real disenfranchised that the millennials have, have been disappoint, disappointed with how much Barack Obama has not been able to deliver on all that he promised. And so I'm curious to know how you feel as though a millennial vote is going to have an impact or a lack of an impact on this, on this election. Who are the millennials? 18 to 29 years old. <laughs> and they came out in full force for Obama in 2008. Absolutely. Um, first time registrants. And right now it's a depressed voter block. Um, in polls, what's being shown is that millennials are disengaged, they're not where they were in 2008, they're unemployed, they're living at home, and if they are employed, they're not necessarily happy with their employment. So it's a very disenfranchised block of voters. I think Obama is now starting to reach out to them. I think he's done it way too late. Um, I don't think it's necessarily a lost opportunity yet. He's got till November to make the case that they should come back to him. But it, it does baffle me with all the social media that the Obama team used in 2008 that they didn't continue that, that engagement at that level throughout the past three and a half years. I think that's been a real miscalculation. Yeah. Folks, we are, have to be mindful of our time and we do want to set aside a little bit for uh, some mingling and uh, a chance to talk with one another and of course the panelists. I want to thank Susan and Jennifer and Casey and Shirley Ann for a wonderful evening and as you can see our, su our students are being very well served. Thank you so much for coming.